Hey everybody. I got some doodle stones down in the basement. I'm kidding, I'm sorry. Okay. So ah the key's messing up. Don't do that. Okay. And we're back with doodle stones. So we finished uh, last time. We finished protostomes. Oh, finally. And now we are on to the deuterostomes. Um, and so today I want to get through echinoderms and start on chordates and hopefully get to vertebrates because we have two subphyla of chordates that are not vertebrates that I want to get there. Um, so we're going to get started. We're going to jump in. All right. So echinodermata, just to back up a tad from where we were last time, I gave you a little bit of of overview of the echinoderms. So now we're just gonna move through the classes. Most of the taxonomy you need mainly for your lab exam. Um, but I do wanna talk about them. You do need to know the characteristics of echinoderms, but this is kind of helpful for your lab final. So five extant classes. Remember extant means that they're still alive. It's the opposite of extinct. So first is Asteroidea. Asteroidea are the, that's, oh wow, my hair looks really bad. The sea stars. I didn't look in the mirror. It's okay. You still like me, okay? Yeah. Okay. Asteroidea, the sea stars. There are 1,500 species. Again, you don't have to remember exactly how many species, but I just want to give you a, um, an index, kind of, of how many you'll find. And these organisms... Uh, are found also all over um, from the intertidal community up towards the shore down through um, all over the ocean okay and they range pretty well in size you have pretty small sea stars that you've probably seen before uh, all the way up to humongous starfish or sea stars like that okay so that's what asteroidia and remember this is an important thing for you to remember if I were to ask you what their feet, what they eat, or what their feeding mode is, you would tell me they eat other animals. Oh, now, now we've got a helicopter right over my house. It's only y'all. Y'all should have been there when I was trying to do my biosets lecture. It was like I don't know. Anyway, so important predators. They are carnivorous. They eat other animals, uh, mollusks, sea urchins. You name it. They use those two feet. To, to eat it. Here you have uh, a, a starfish, sea star, enjoying some crab legs and the whole crab. So they can use those two feet, which are used for locomotion. So those two feet they use for locomotion as well as feeding because they crack things open with it. They can really use those feet to pull apart mollusk shells. Okay, cool. So just remember they eat other animals. And these guys are pinturadial, so they have five rays or some multiple of five. Um, and remember, they can also, um, 23, they can also regenerate, which is pretty cool. Okay, so that's the asteroidia. Ophiroidia. These are the brittle stars. They're called brittle stars because they are brittle. It's real. Uh, they actually aren't very, they don't. They're not very flexible. So if you were to go, oh, you could actually break off their their arm. So um, these are actually the most common echinoderms, oddly enough. It's not sea stars, which you might think. It's the brittle stars. And these, this says they are almost solid, so that's why they're so brittle, like I just said. And their arms are equal diameter their entire length. Okay. And they do not have some of the you would expect them to have, you know, some of the structures that the asteroidia have. They don't. They don't have suckers. They don't have ampullae. Well, they don't have tube feet. Um, they don't have ampullae. They actually, the way they move is kind of this rowing motion. It's almost like you would you see in a cephalopod. I think I talked about that. They don't use those tube feet because they don't have them. They like use their their arms and walk. Just imagine a star walking. It's like that. Okay. Um, I highly suggest that you watch a YouTube video because that sounds like fun. Maybe I'll do that too. Also, these guys, uh, oh, they don't have an anus. They they excrete waste back through their mouth. Fun fact. Unlike Asteroidea, right, who do have on their oral surface, the sea stars have a mouth, right, and on their aboral surface they have their anus. 
these organisms, the ophiuroids, um, they just have a mouth and they take things in and excrete things through it. Okay, these are nocturnal animals. All right, let's talk about the echinoids. Echinoidia. So these are the sea urchins and the sand dollars. Remember that it's both the sea urchins and the sand dollars. So I'm giving like, hello, remember. So these organisms don't have rays like the Asteroidea and the Ophiroidea. They just have, uh, they just do still have two feet, but they don't have those rays or arms, okay? And they do also have protective movable spines. Um, and these organisms, remember those spines are primarily for protection and they can actually use them a little in locomotion, but they also have two feet that they use for locomotion. So remember that that's an important way that these organisms get around. And there are 950 extant species of these, but many of which are extinct. 5,000 species are actually extinct. So um, there are more extinct species of Echinoidea than there are actually extant. But here you have a sea urchin and a few other sea urchins. Um, and remember, the feeding structure in a sea urchin is called a what? That's right, Aristotle's lantern. Very good, very good. It's got that, those five teeth, right, that help it eat. And then here you have a sand dollar. Great. And that's not, that's not an echinoid. These are echinoid, yeah. So, oh yes, it is an echinoid. Um, so one thing about these guys, sea urchins are actually a pretty, they're considered a delicacy. Actually, that is not an echinoid. That's a hollow fewer. Um, these sea urchins are prized. They're a delicacy in many, uh, I, think, I think they're primarily Asian cuisine, but I could be wrong. Um, I have not ever eaten a sea urchin myself, um, but also sea cucumbers, that is, it's a hollow theory, um, is seen as a delicacy in some cuisines. So, yeah. And if you're an otter, they're a fun little ball to play with. Is that adorable? Okay. You're welcome. So, what makes an echinoderm related to mammals like us? Remember, they are deuterostomes, and their five key features, not five, there are four, sorry, are uh, they have pentaradial symmetry as adults. Go, my dog. All right, they have that endoskeleton made of ossicles that actually protrudes out. They have the water vascular system. And remember, the water vascular system, how water moves into the animal and throughout the animal to help it with movement. So we're going to, let's do the song real fast. Okay, ready? The, start with the madreporite, right? That's on the aboral surface. The aboral surface is the surface of the anus that's usually facing up. All right. So the madreporite is connected to the stone canal. The stone canal is connected to the ring canal. The ring canal is connected to the radial canal. Radial clouds connect to the two feet, and that's the water vascular system. Technically, the ampullae, you have the radial canal and then the ampullae and the two feet, but that's okay. That's all right. You can just remember radial canal and two feet. That's fine. Okay? Cool. And also, these animals can regenerate, which is amazing. So, those are four things you'll want to remember about them. And not too hard to remember, right? If you just look at any kind of derm, you're like, yep, you are pentaradially symmetrical. And I think I mentioned in lab um, that if you looked at a sea cucumber like head on, you would see it is actually pentaradial symmetrical. They do actually have little grooves in their bodies. So if you're confused, you're like, what about sea cucumbers? They actually are pentaradial, pentaradially symmetrical too. So, um, and you can see the endoskeleton. You can see that water vascular system via the madreporite. Okay, so those are three of those characteristics you can see if you just look, particularly at an asteroid. Um, ast the asteroidia. So just think of a sea star, and that'll help you remember at least three of them, okay? And then, like, pretend you're lopping off the arm, and it regenerates. There, you remember the fourth. Okay. So, remember the classes, right? Review. And I didn't really go into some of these because your book really only goes into, so in, for lecture, your book really only goes into the echinoids um, and the ophiroids and the asteroids, uh, the sea stars. But remember, there are five extant classes that you need to remember for lab, right? So Asteroidea is the sea stars. Holothuroidea is the sea cucumbers. And they have those little tentacles around their mouth to help them eat, right? And they, uh, will, they will eject their digestive system as a defense mechanism, right? Okay. Echinoidea, of course, 
the sea urchins and the sand dollars. Crinoidea, those are the uh, sea lilies, right? And the alfuroidea, those are the brittle stars. Oh, and remember the crinoids, they are filter feeders. It's important to remember too. Always ask yourself, you know, especially when you're studying for your lab exam, because again, I, these overlap a lot now, like, how does this organism eat? Because you might be asked. And how does this organism move? Because you might be asked. Okay, cool. So, that's the echinoderms. That's it. High five. We did it. Okay. So, you might notice that you really just have to know what they are and a few key characteristics about them, right? Not too bad. So, let's start. Let's go into the chordates. Oh, I'm so excited about the chordates. It says, so chordata. What is specific to phylum chordata? Well, I will tell you. Um, first, the main thing is that we have an endoskeleton that is very different from kinoderms because we don't have ossicles that protrude through our skin because that is horrifying. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but it's true. The kinoderms, um, they are like, we have this truly internal endoskeleton, right? Echinoderms, they're ossicles since they're kind of on the outside. They're not on the outside, but they protrude. They're kind of like an arthropod, right? But we have this endoskeleton that is, is really hard, kind of like the arthropod exoskeleton. But that's our main evolutionary feature is that endoskeleton, okay? And it may be made of bone or cartilage. So let's talk about, these are the animals we're going to spend time talking about the rest of the semester, except we are going to back up and talk about some of the more um, the more simple chordates, because there, like I said, are two subphyla of chordates that do not, um, that don't have vertebrae. vertebrae. So, we're going to talk about, talk about fish, we're going to talk about amphibians, okay, we're going to talk about reptiles, we're going to talk about birds, we're going to talk about mammals, but before we get there, we are first going to talk about, I know, tunicates and lancelets. But hey, like I said, this is review for your mod too. So it's great. Okay, four phylum, oh, four phylum characteristics for chordates. You must commit these to memory. Commit them to memory for the rest of your life. Okay. So these features are what makes a chordate a chordate, and every chordate has them at some point in their life. Though for many chordates, it's just an embryonic development. Okay. So. All chordates have a dorsal hollow nerve cord. You have one. All right. All chordates at some point have a notochord. Some chordates, the notochord stays with them, like in lancelets. The notochord is, I'll show you on the next slide, I believe, but the notochord is typically just before you get to, um, it's like, well, I'll just show you. Here we go. So the hollow nerve cord is on the far dorsal part of it, of the organism. And then your notochord is just inside of that. And in vertebrae, that's what becomes our vertebral column. Okay. We also have pharyngeal slits, often called pharyngeal pouches, which are essentially a vestige of our aquatic ancestry. And we'll talk about what those have become in humans, because that's you still have your pharyngeal pouches in your body. Well, one of them. Don't yeah. Anyway, and you have a postanal tail as an embryo, like Goku. Okay, so those four things, dorsal, hollow, dorsal nerve cord, right? Notochord, pharyngeal gill slits or pouches is actually better to say, honestly, because for in some of the organisms, they don't look completely open, whereas it actually is more like pouches, and post anal tails, okay? So, cord, and, wait, can we make a song out of that? Nerve cord, notochord, and pouches and tail, pouches and tail. Nerve cord and notochord, pouches and tail, pouches and tail. Oh, I'm gonna do it again. Nerve cord, notochord, pouches and tail, pouches and tail. Okay, if you do it, you can sing it. That'll help you. Nerve cord, notochord, pouches and tail, pouches. I'm actually touching myself too. Look in the back. Notochord, nope. Nerve cord, notochord. Those are your vertebrae. Pop becomes your vertebrae. Pouches and tail, pouches and tail. Okay. Great. So you can just see um, in the embryonic chordate, and this would be, this is almost certainly a, um, a vertebrate, but it looks a little like a vertebrate. It's, it's almost certainly a vertebrate, embryonic vertebrate. So again, 
got that ver got that nerve core, right? You got that notochord right here. That's going to become it's going to develop into the vertebral column and a vertebrate. Um, your pharyngeal pouches and the tail. So precious. So you and we talked about this when we talked about evolution because we talked about how similarly, right? That similar those similarities in embryonic development point to a a common evolutionary origin, right? Cool. So let's talk about what happened to them. Where did your stuff go? <laughs> Where'd your Where'd your tail go? Right? Well, uh, I don't know if you know this, but you still have a dorsal nerve cord. At least I hope you do. Because um, if you don't, then you can't really move. And that's really sad. Oh, well, maybe not sad. No, I mean, you know, live your life. Anyway, so um, you still have a, a dorsal nerve cord. That's your spinal cord. Okay. Your notochord develops into the vertebral column in a vertebrate. All right. So that's what that was. And it encases that nerve cord. It protects it. Your pharyngeal pouches, you still have a vestigial pharyngeal pouch. It'd be right, it's right here. And it goes from your ears to your throat, well, your ears to your nasopharyngeal passages. It's your, what we call the eustachian tube, okay? When you talk about having an ear infection, it's typically because you've got issues with the eustachian tube. So those that eustachian tube is a vestige of a pharyngeal pouch, okay? And then your, uh, your tail <laughs> is now your coccyx or your tailbone. Okay, cool. Other features of chordates. So my, so these are um, repeating units of muscle that you are typically best seen in the developing organism, but you can also see them in some, in some other organisms. That's how our muscles are organized. Okay, so our muscles are organized into repeating units called somites. That is a feature of chordates. I'm going to say that again. Our muscles are... Um, are organized into repeating units called somites, and that is a hallmark of chordates. Okay. We also have this endoskeleton, and it's particularly useful for our muscles to actually work against. So the skeletal system and the muscular system actually work in concert with each other. Um, our muscular system would, or our muscles wouldn't work as well if we didn't have that hard endoskeleton for them to be supported against as they flex, okay, as the muscle fibers. Um, what word I'm looking for? I'm thinking of actinomyosin filament, filaments right now, but I'm, I'm trying as they flex. Let's just go with that. Okay, so let's talk about the chordate subphyla. There are three. And we, we talked about all three of these in lab. We have the urochordata, the cephalochordata, which are not vertebrates, and then vertebrata, which are the vertebrates. So the urochordata are the tunicates and salps. So they are, they basically look like baskets, and the salps particularly look like little clear, comey things. I mean, it is, that's what they look like. Um, but remember, in the urochordata, the tunicates, they're um, the tunicate larva, so you'll want to remember this is what a tunicate larva looks like. They actually have, before they develop into adults, they have this post anal tail, right, with the notochord and dorsal, dorsal nerve cord with gill slits, just like, just like you, only it looks very different. And they are mobile, but they will eventually, let me just move here. Are they chordates? Yes, they are. They will eventually become adults who are sessile. And filter feeding like this. And man, I always say, I just always think they look like um, grape hyacinths, bees. They look like a kind of flower, but they're not. They are a chordate animal. Okay, so this is urochordata. These are tunicates and they're filter feeding. They actually they bring in water and then they catch things, um, organisms in their pharynx. But as a larva, they are free living, they're free swimming, and they have all of those features of the chordates. Okay, and I'm going to let you watch this video on your own time, but it is a video showing you um, tunicates, the urochordates. Okay, let's move on to the cephalochordata. I'm going through this a little quickly, so you're welcome to go back and watch or to pause where you need to, but I'm going through it fairly quickly just because we have a lot of organisms to get through now. Um, but you can, you're welcome to take your time with them. And yeah, just take your time. And be sure to read your book because your book gives good information about these. I try to give you, you know, all the info that I want you to have, but your book is 
incredibly helpful and supporting this information, and you definitely should be reading it. Okay, so the lancelets, these are cephalocordates. Hey, come on. Cephalocordata, these are very small aquatic organisms, and they, um, there are about 30 species of them, but most of them fall into genus Branchiostoma, which we also to call Amphioxus. If you ever hear the word Amphioxus, those are lancelets. They're actually called lancelets because they're actually named after lancets, which are those little surgical knives. They are scaleless, and they live, they're, like I said, they're aquatic. They tend to live burrowed in sediments. So you see they're burrowed here, and basically just the anterior end of the animal sticks out, and they have tentacles around their mouth, and they basically catch plankton that come by, really small zooplankton that come by. They're very small, as you can see here. And again, they're burrowed with their posterior end in the sediments with their heads out in aquatic systems. Okay, and one feature of the cephalochordates is that as opposed to many chordates wh whose notochord becomes something else, um, these organisms have, or, you know, they have a persistent notochord. You saw the tunica, it's like where's the notochord essentially it's gone after the larval stage. Here you have a persistent notochord in the cephalochordates. So you'll want to remember that. Okay, their chordate, their, um, excuse me, notochord stays with them. All right, so these are basically just tiny fish-like organisms. They're not really, I mean, they're not true fishes, but they are, they're lancelets. Okay, little aquatic organisms that are fish-like. And you can actually pretty much see through them, which is pretty cool. So that's it, that's cephalochordates and urochordates. So we're gonna go ahead and talk about vertebrates. So vertebrates are, I mean, do you know what a vertebrate is? Most organisms are not vertebrates, but most of the things people like to talk about when they talk about animals are vertebrates. So vertebrates are chordates with a spinal column. That's what the notochord becomes. So what types of tissue are vertebrate? I'm glad you asked. Your vertebrae are made of bone and cartilage. Okay, so bone is, you know, uh, calcium phosphate, cal calcareous material that is very hard, whereas cartilage is much more um, pliable. You have cartilage in your nose that you can move very easily. Okay, so you have, and that gives the bony segments and the cartilaginous segments and the fact that they're kind of, um, I'll show you, so, um, in sections gives our vertebral column a lot of flexibility. So what distinguishes vertebrates from non-vertebrates? There are actually a few characteristics besides just that vertebral column. That's the first one. So you have the vertebrae and this is protecting the dorsal nerve cord. We have um, the the head that has three pairs of sensory organs, so ears, eyes, and then nostrils for the nose. You don't have a mouth, right? So just know you have three sets of sensory organs in the head. That is a distinguishing characteristic of um, actually vertebrates. So ears, nose, eyes. But remember, you also have a mouth. We also have a neural crest, which is um, a group of cells found in embryonic vertebrates that basically forms certain vertebrate structures. Okay, so here, these are basically, they're cells differentiating different certain type of cells that will become um, other parts of the vertebrate. Okay, and it's, when you're talking about like embryonic cell lines, it's one of those cell lines um, that will become various parts of the vertebrate, various kinds of cells, just like you have other cells that will become, um, you know, neural cells and things like that. Okay, so that's important to remember that we have a neural, we have a neural crest. Well, let me go back to it. A neural crest that gives rise to these neural crest cells that will become something else, okay? That is a feature of the vertebrates. Okay, so internal organs. You might be familiar with these. Um, oh, I, I actually wanna tell you, these, this, they're called the neural crest cells because 
they so this is the neural tube they develop here on the crest of the neural tube that's actually why they're called that okay so internal organs you might be familiar with some of these so vertebrates have a liver kidneys an endocrine system or endocrine glands right the a heart and a closed circulatory system okay we also have, let's see, so notice, and you also have the head, the brain, and some endocrine glands encased in the skull. So, again, vertebrates have an endoskeleton that is made of cartilage or bone. Some organisms in the vertebrate and vertebrata are just have cartilaginous skeletons, such as the shark skates and rays, and class chondriac feet. So, what is good about having an endoskeleton? You like having a skeleton? I think it's okay. I mean, if you think about it, I'm looking outside. If you think about it, we're just like skeletons walking around. You ever thought about that? Ooh. Anyway, that, endo that endoskeleton can be very helpful because it allows for a few things. I'm sure you can come up with a few, but the endoskeleton protects our internal organs that's kind of important, right? The endoskeleton supports the movement of our muscles, as we mentioned before. It helps us basically move. And the endoskeleton is important for movement, not just because the muscles move against the skeleton that give, you know, basically power and strength to our movements, but also the skeleton provides us with um, structure while still allowing us movement because we, we have joints, right? So that endoskeleton is really helpful and important. All right, so let's talk a little bit about um, vertebrate history. So the first vertebrates appeared in, they were marine about 545 million years ago, and they were fish-like organisms. And soon you had jawed fishes. So you started out with these fish-like organisms, and then the development of the jaw came about. And you're gonna see this when we talk about the vertebrates. You know, we talk about agnatha, which are the jawless fishes, and then we move on to other kinds of fishes. That's because the jaw was actually an innovation in evolution. So you had jawless fishes or fish-like organisms, and then you had jawed fishes. And then amphibians are where that big jump from uh, water to land happened. So, Amphibious existence was a huge jump in evolution. And then and we're going to talk about each of these groups of organisms in turn. And then eventually reptiles replaced amphibians. Reptiles inherited the earth, essentially. And those first rep those large reptiles were in the form of the dinosaurs, of course. Yep. So dinosaurs and mammals. Mammals were not the dominant organisms for millions of years. We were teeny tiny little shrew-like things, and I shouldn't say we. Um, early mammals were very tiny, and dinosaurs, repti large reptiles, were the dominant organisms on Earth until the mass extinction 65 million years ago of the dinosaurs. The dinosaurs all died out. We talked about this a little bit, I think, earlier in the class. Um, so once the dinosaurs were gone, then you had these open niches. And so birds and mammals became dominant after that mass extinction. Okay. So that precipitated the invasion of um, land of mammals, land mammals particularly, and the air with the avians. So that's kind of a, that's a brief history of all the, this is just a brief history, you know, of everything. There you go. So let's, let's, can we do that again? Let's do it again. So you started out, fishes, jawed fishes, right? Amphibians moved on to land. And we're going to talk about a lot of the characteristics of amphibians. We're actually going to go through all of these kinds of vertebrates. So those of you who are like amphibian people and reptile people are going to really love this. And, fit, and everybody, bird people, mammal people, we're going to get into all of it. So amphibians were then supplanted by the reptiles. The dinosaurs took over, and then there was that mass extinction in the Cretaceous, and from that time on, then you had mammals and 
avians uh, becoming dominant on the planet. All right, so now let's talk about fish. So the fishes are the most diverse vertebrate group, which is basically indicative of the fact that you've had lo a longer evolutionary history with fishes. They've had longer to evolve, and they provided the evolutionary base for the invasion of land by amphibians, because you actually have some fish that have, um, well, they have primitive organs that allow for some land activity, like here in the mudskippers. So let's talk about an, an overview, a little overview of fish phylogeny. Um, I may have to move these a little bit. So back here, you have your recorded ancestor, right? And we first have the jawless fishes. So those are the hagfish and the lamprey. And we're going to talk about all of these in just a minute after we talk about the different characteristics of these organisms. But just so you can see here, these are their various um, innovations. So you don't have a jaw. You only have rudimentary vertebrae in the hagfishes. But when you get to the lampreys, they have the development of a dorsal fin and um, more, a more complete skeleton. And then when you move from the cephalospidomorphy, which are agmatha, um, so agmatha, the jawless fishes, or these together, okay? You move from there to the cartilaginous fishes, chondrichthys, which are the shark skates and rays. And then you have, um, Full development of the jaw right before you get to chondriacthes. So you have the agmatha, the jawless fishes, and then development of the jaw is a key innovation there. Okay, let's talk about the characteristics of fishes. So the first is they have a complete vertebral column except for those ancestral fishes, the hagfish ooh, and the lampreys. Okay, they do not have a complete vertebral column. You do have um, skeletal plates here on the dorsal part of the lamprey, but it's not a complete vertebral column. Okay, they do have it is a hallmark of fishes, though, is to have a vertebral column, and they are included in the vertebrates. Okay, they have jaws and paired appendages, and again, in most of this, you'll see the hagfish, McSinney, and cephalospidomorphy lampreys, agmatha, the jawless fishes are exceptions. So, you have jaws developed in the jawed fishes and the various lineages past the jawless fishes, and you have paired appendages. Those may either be lobes as fins or rays as fins, and there are two particular lineages, the lobe-finned fishes, which are the sarcopterygii, and the ray-finned fishes, which are the actinopterygii, which we'll look at again in, in, a, in a minute, okay? But those are paired. You have internal gills for gas exchange, and those are covered. You have the, it's pulled back here, or maybe it's been cut by a poor fish. You, the internal gills are um, covered by that opercular opening or the operculum. You have single loop blood circulation. So basically blood just moves one way, and you have a very simple heart with a single atrium and a single ventricle, and it basically moves like in a circle through the fish. It's a really simple closed circulatory system, okay, for gas exchange. It is closed, but it's super, super simple, like single loop. And basically, this when you have fishes, you have the development of these nutritional deficiencies. So this is something that we all have inherited. Um, and so there are certain, certain amino acids that we can't make. We call them essential amino acids. So... These, in the fishes, you have this inability to synthesize certain amino acids. All of us have, been, we, this has been inherited by the entire lineages, extant lineages past the fishes. So you'll find essential amino acids that are necessary for, um, for growth and development that cannot be made in the organism itself. It's a hallmark, actually, of fishes and all the vertebrates after them. So let's talk about the first, the first fishies. The first fishies. These are the, uh, we call them in lab the agmatha, right? So let me put it in here. The jawless fishes. So A, meaning without, and then math, G-N-A-T-H, that actually means jaw. So 
So it just means no jaw. Okay. So the first fish is didn't have a jaw. And you'll remember with the lamprey, and we're going to see the lampreys in a minute, it has that really round mouth full of teeth because they are parasitic. So let's start with the mixinny. So um, these are the hagfishes. They are gross. Okay. So these organisms don't have any, they don't have any fins, no appendages. They kind of almost look like snaky things. There are 60 species of these. These are scavenging animals. They are completely blind, but they do have a sense of smell. And they slime. That's actually one of the one of the um, defense mechanisms of these fishes is that they they slime. You should definitely look it up. Hagfish sliming. It's crazy. And they've actually been um, they're hunted by humans for their uh, their skin because it's really nice and people make like bags out of it. So those are the hagfish. All right. Now. Um, the cephalospidomorphy, these are the lampreys. And so here's the thing. In lab, we talk about um, agnatha. So those are all the jawless fishes together. And then they've been separated um, into mixinny and cephalospidomorphy. You mainly just need to remember, like, these are the hagfishes and these are the lampreys. They're together, agnatha. But I don't want to confuse you because I know you're like, wait, didn't we learn agnatha? Yes, it includes both of them. But these are just um, further divisions of the animals. Okay, so the lampreys, remember, they have that really round mouth that they use to latch onto fish, and they are parasitic. There are not very many kinds of lampreys um, left, but we are we do find them. We have lampreys in Arkansas. You have lampreys. You'll find them in the rivers. Um, most of them are parasitic, but you do actually have some free free living free swimming lampreys, um, okay? But most of the time when you encounter them, you'll find them on fishes, that they are parasitizing. And they don't have paired appendages, but they do have a fin. They do have a dorsal fin. Okay, pretty simple with these animals, right? So let's, and man, I just, I always go back to the hagfish because I'm just like, ooh, ooh. I don't want to meet a hagfish in the dark alley, I just says for sure. Okay, so let's talk about chondriac seas. Um, these are the sharks, skates, and rays. And they are, they're still predatory. Uh oh, oh no, I might have to end this lecture early. Hey, Blake. Okay. Well, you might have to move to the living room. And no, I have a pantry. Let's go. Okay. So let's talk about chondrixies, the sharks, the skates, and the rays, right? Yes. Including, this is the class, whole class of organisms, one of its members killed Steve Irwin. Okay. Just know I have those in this entire class of organisms. I mean, Steve wouldn't want that. He wouldn't. Okay, I'm sorry, I'm sorry at my computer. I had to come visit you guys. Okay. Hey. I'll just get comfy here. Okay. Well, now I could lecture for hours. Okay. So these are the chondroichthyes. The way I remember how to spell it is chondroichthyes, if that's helpful. These are the cartilaginous fishes, all right? So, that is a very important thing to remember about them because that is a special thing about the chondroic thieves is that they are cartilaginous. And, you know, I'm not well, I'm not reading through every single bit of this. Like, in terms of, I will tell you, in terms of history, like the Carboniferous and the Cretaceous and such, um, so forth, I don't, I'm trying to, like, make it where you're not being blinded. I don't spend as much time, some of you are like, Ziggy's back there. Yes, she is. Hold on. Ziggy! Hey, what's up? You're a mammal. Okay. So, I don't spend as much time, like, if you're worried about that, don't. Okay, but do know that they were dominant sea predators, you know, some million years ago, and they are still very important predatory organisms within um, within marine environments. And, but the main thing, cartilaginous fishes, that light skeleton, super, 
super flexible. Okay. Sharks are really good at yoga. Just remember that. That'll help, right? Okay. So these, again, sharks, skates, and rice, I say it over and over just to help you remember because when you're first getting introduced, it can be hard to remember them. So it's, and I have to keep reminding myself that this is new to you. So one thing to remember about these organisms, they don't have a swim bladder. A swim bladder is an organ, an organ, organ, an organ that is used to help the animal change um, depth. But chondrichthyes do not have a swim bladder. Okay, they actually have to control their depth like by swimming. And there is this shark's class picture. No, it's cute. They have. So many teeth. I don't know if you've heard of sharks with teeth, but they have them. And these were the first fish to really have teeth. I mean, the lampreys do have um, tooth-like projections, but these are like teeth that you will grow in, and they just keep growing and keep growing and keep growing, and they will actually, if they fall out, they come back. They have so many teeth. Just, they just like they just have a lot of teeth, guys. Okay. And if you were to pet a shark, it would not be pleasant because it feels like sandpaper because their scales on a microscopic level look like a spook mat. And you probably don't know what a spook mat is, but look up spook mat. Let me put it over here. Because that is like a, um, that is like sharks, shark scales. They're very rough. All right. But here you have um, the development, and the chondrichthyes was where we had the development of the lateral line, which is a series of organs right underneath the skin that allow the animal to detect changes in pressure in the water, which is really important for sensing the environment. You can actually see the lateral line on this little fishy right here. It starts there, and it goes back. That is, that is the lateral line, which is that series of organs that help it to detect changes in the water, particularly with pressure. All right, how do these organisms reproduce? Well, you have claspers, they have internal fer fertilization, okay? And the, um, the organisms basically, they clasp the female and mate and have internal fertilization. Pretty simple reproduction. I mean, a lot of these um, organisms that we're getting to, you are probably somewhat familiar with the way that they reproduce. Now, you may not be with sharks, and that's okay. The main thing to remember is that they have internal fertilization, not external. Okay. So, oh, there it is. Yes. So you have internal fertilization. Some of them lay eggs and some of them don't. So, because it's a class that's pretty large, you know, sharks, skates, and rays are a pretty diverse group of organisms, and they gestate for quite a while. Um, I'm trying to think exactly, because it depends on the shark. But I mean, like, we're talking like months, like, you know, almost like mammals, okay? Longer than most animals um, at this, in, the, in these group, in this group, fishes, much longer than most fishes. Okay, so those are the class chondrichthyes, the cartilaginous fishes, okay? So now we shall talk about the bony fishes. So in lab, we call them osteichthyes. Um, they're also referred to as teleosts. Those are the bony fishes. Okay. You'll want to remember in lab they're the osteichthyes. And the, and the teleosts, osteichthyes, are divided into two lineages, the actinopterygii and the sarcopterygii. So we're going to talk about the actinopterygii, which are the ray finned fishes. Okay. So these. board. Too bad. We're talking about fishes. So these organisms have a swim bladder. The bony fishes have the swim bladder that allow them to change depth um, in the water. Very important for changes in buoyancy. Okay. And this is an internal organ, so it's filled and drained internally. And so this is a big difference. This was a key innovation between the bony fishes and the cartilaginous fishes. Aside from the fact that their bones were also like actually bones and not cartilage, the being made of cartilage actually is a really 
advantageous thing because you're lighter and um, you're lighter and you are more, uh, you know, agile. Look, I'm a shark. Yeah, okay. So with the sharks, remember, you ha they have to actually swim to maintain depth and to change depth. Whereas the fish can just regulate, these bony fish can just regulate it via the swim bladder. All right. So this is just to look at a, a little bit of the inside of a fish here. So you swim bladder here, all right, you have a gas gland, and you have the very simple, um, very simple um, closed circulatory system where you have um, basically these two blood vessels that go around the organism. I told you, there's just like when this one little ring around the organism. It is. It's just those two little blood vessels going around the organism. I'm not even joking. Okay. You've exchanged, got some capillaries here. But I just, the main thing you need to know is it's a really simple circulatory system. Still closed, though. And again, it's kind of like this ring around the organism of these, of this, um, these two blood vessels. Again, they have that operculum that protects their gills. And obviously, um, you've probably seen a fish. And so you've probably seen a fish operculum. Oftentimes, people actually will grab, actually, do you grab the fish? You grab the fish by the mouth. But a lot of folks will actually hold on to the operculum too. They'll hook it. So that is a gill covering. Um, and if you've ever touched it, you'll feel that it is pretty hard, but you can move it back a little bit. All right. And it allows, basically, they can move it to help with gas exchange too. You've probably seen that. So um, here, again, I told you there are these two lineages. You have the Actinoptera GI and the Sarcoptera GI. So, whoop. And the Actinoptera GI are the ray finned fishes, okay? And the lobe finned fishes actually have a muscle in their fin. And these, the lobe finned fishes are who um, like coelacanths, if you've ever heard of a coelacanth, that is an ancient, ancient um, coelacanth, an ancient lobe finned fish. So, and these are the actual, the ancestors of the amphibians are the lobe finned fishes because they had these lobes that eventually became appendages. That's right, they became appendages. So, you can kind of see the difference here. So you have just a ray as opposed to a um, more like a lobe coming out. So it's basically they have more flesh, like they have more meat that comes out. Because they do still have a ray there at the end, but they have that lobe that's a part of the ray. So it's a lot meatier. So that was able to, over time, with natural selection working on that, you had the development of appendages in amphibians. Okay, so that is all for the fishes, and I'm just right at 15 minutes. Y'all, I didn't think I was going to get this far today, and I know some of you are probably like, what just happened? Fish! That's what happened. Fish! So, go watch Finding Nemo. Just kidding. Actually, you can. Um, so, that's all for today. When we come back on Monday, the next week is the last week of class. I was going to try to finish early, but, um, and if I can, I will, but I thought I was going to finish like a week early and now I'm only at fishes. So on Monday, we're going to talk about amphibians and reptiles, and hopefully we can get into birds and then we'll talk about mammals and that will be it. Um, for be, do be sure to read in your book. Okay. That helps with studying and, um, yeah, let me know if you have any questions. I'll see you next week. Good job. Good job watching the video.